Hey guys, this is Stone Cold Export, and in this video, we are testing five different six core AMD CPUs. The tests will be mostly gaming at 1080p with a couple of 1440p results. And the CPUs we are testing are the Phenom 2 X6 1090T, the FX6300, the Ryzen R5 1600. I don't actually have a 2600, so a 2700X with two cores disabled and running at 3.7 GHz should be fairly close to a stock 2600. And then we have the 3600. For testing, I used a Gigabyte RTX 2070 Super Gaming OC graphics card. And for the Ryzen CPUs, I used an MSI B450M Gaming Plus motherboard. And for the Phenom and FX CPUs, I used a Gigabyte 990X motherboard. So the Phenom 2 1090T was overclocked to 3.9 GHz with 16 GB of 1600 MHz DDR3 memory and a 2.6 GHz North Bridge overclock. The FX6300 was overclocked to 4.5 GHz with 16 GB of 2000 MHz DDR3 memory and the Ryzen's were first tested at stock speeds with some Corsair 3200 MHz CL16 memory then I tried to extract the most amount of performance I could from them with a pair of BDI sticks with manually set timings. For the Ryzen R5 600 I only achieved a 3.8 GHz overclock, but it is also paired with 3466 MHz memory running at CL14. For the 2600 I stopped at 4.1 GHz with 3600 MHz memory at CL15, and my 3600 is only able to do a 4.2 GHz all-core overclock, so I opted to use PBO and Auto OC. This gave me an all-core clock speed of 4.1 GHz, which is about the same as stock, but it managed to boost to 4.4 GHz in less CPU-heavy tasks, such as gaming. Now, I used the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black Edition for all the CPUs, and now let's look at the results. In Cinebench R20, the FX6300 is coming out last uh, with a single core result of 181 points and a multi thread score of 1122 points. In front of that, we find the older Phenom 2 1090T with a single core score of 219 points and a multi thread score of 1281 points. A 21% lead in the single core score and a 14% lead in the multi thread score. In front of the Phenom, we find the first gen Ryzen at 360 points single core and 2494 points multi core which amounts to a 64% lead in the single core test and a 95% lead in the multi-threaded test. It is worth mentioning that the Ryzen CPUs features two threads per core and the FX and Phenom CPUs only have one thread per core. The stock R5 2600 is coming in at 2744 points with a single core score of 378 points, a 10% lead in the multi-core score and a small 5% lead in the single threaded score. Then we have the overclocked R5 1600, which is about on par with the with a stock 2600. However, when we overclock the 2600, the multi-core score increases by 16%, while the single-core score has a smaller 12% increase. At the very top, we find the R5 3600, which is 7% faster in the multi-threaded test than the overclocked 2600, and 16% ahead in the single-threaded test. Using PBO and Auto OC increases the multi-core score by an insignificant amount, and the single-core score does increase by 3%. Now let's see what kind of power draw these CPUs have when running Cinebench R20. Again, I didn't have a 2600, so I used a 2700X with 2 core disabled and a 3.7 GHz, therefore this result may be inaccurate. The numbers are the total power draw at the PSU's 12V rail. That rail is used by both the CPU and the GPU, but in this test the GPU is just idling. Both the 2600 and 3600 pulled 118 watts from the PSU's 12V rail while running Cinebench R20. When using PBO and Auto OC, the power consumption for the 3600 increased by just 6 watts. The stock 1600 pulled 115 watts, which is 37 watts more than the 2600 and 3600. While overclocked, the 2600 came in at 6 watts ahead of the 1600, which means the 2600 increased its power consumption by 43 watts when overclocked. The 1600 increased its consumption slightly less at 33 watts. 
but the showstoppers here are the FX and Phenom CPUs, which both pulled 250 watts from the PSU's 12 volt rail. Now, we move on to memory performance. We start off with the read speeds, and obviously, the newer Ryzen's with the DDR4 is dominating the older DDR3 based CPUs. And there's nothing really surprising here, with all Ryzen's running the same 3200MHz memory, the read speeds are around 46,000MB per second, with the new Ryzen being faster. Let's take a look at latency. When it comes to memory latency, the older AMD CPUs is coming out on top here, with the FX6300 being tied with the overclocked 2600. The 2600 with fast memory is actually the Ryzen with the lowest memory latency, but will that have an impact on the next couple of tests? Let's find out. We start by transcoding a video in Handbrake using the 1080p 30 fast preset. These are the average figures, and here the old AMD CPUs are really showing their age, with both coming in just short of 25 frames per second on average. The first gen Ryzen is at, at stock, or twice as fast, at 51.3 frames per second on average, and overclocking it brings it almost on par with the stock 2600, which did 59.2 frames per second on average. Overclocking the 2600 increases performance by 10%, but it is still shy of the 3600, which is 14% faster than the overclocked 2600. Using PBO and AutoOC with faster memory is doing nothing for us in this test. A 4.2 GHz all-core overclock would probably be better in this particular test. Now let's get into gaming, and we kick things off with a game that's mostly dependent on single core performance, The Elder Scrolls Online. Here the old FX and Phenom 2 CPUs fall well short of 60 frames per second at 47.3 frames per second on average, and 41.6 frames per second on average respectively. 18% in front of the FX we find the R5 1600 at 56 frames per second on average, still short of the 60 frames per second target, but with better frame times than the older AMD CPUs. The Ryzen 2600 breaks 60 frames per second on average at 64.2 frames per second, 15% ahead of the stock 1600. Overclocking the 1600 brings it on par with the 2600, but if you overclock the 2600 and pair it with fast memory, it is now 21% ahead of the overclocked 1600, and we are now at 79.5 frames per second on average. The R5 3600 stomps on both of them at 87.9 frames per second on average, 16% ahead of the overclock 2600, and if you use auto OC and fast memory, you get an extra 9% of performance. Now let's move on to The Witcher 3. And here we are going on a ride through Novigrad, and coming in just shy of 60 frames per second on average is the Phenom at 58.5 frames per second. The FX 6300 is 15% ahead at 67 frames per second on average. Then the Ryzen R5 1600 is a whopping 49% ahead of the FX 6300 at 99.8 frames per second on average. Slightly ahead of the 1600 we find the 2600 at 102.4 frames per second on average. Overclocking the 1600 brings it 11% ahead of the 2600 at 113.8 frames per second on average. Overclocking the 2600 brings it back out in front and makes it 7% faster than the overclocked 1600. The 3600 on the other hand is 4% ahead of the overclocked 2600 and using PBO plus auto OC with fast memory brings out 8% additional performance. I only tested the Ryzen CPUs at 1440p and at these settings we are now clearly GPU bound. Now let's move on to the Division 2. Bringing up the rear is the Phenom 2 with the FX 6300 ever so slightly ahead. Then we find the R5 1600 32% ahead of the FX at 99.7 frames per second on average. The 2600 is about 6% ahead of the 1600, and from here on out we are moving into a GPU bottleneck. Uh, no point in moving on to 1440p here then. Let's take a look at another game instead. First of all, uh, all the CPUs here delivered good frame rates, and the FX 6300 is close to 10% ahead of the Phenom CPU. The Ryzen R5 1600 is 15% ahead of the FX 6300. The 2600 is 11% ahead of its predecessor at 214.4 frames per second on average. Overclocked, the 1600 overtakes the stock 2600 by 8% and ends up at 231 frames per second on average. However, the 
2600 is again 11% ahead once it is overclocked. Then there is the 3600. Only 3% ahead of the overclocked 2600, but once you get some fast memory and using PBO and Auto OC, that increases to 9%. But the largest gains here are found in the frame times. Let's see what happens when we run this at 1440p. The R5-1600 brings up the rear with 178 frames per second on average. The stock 2600 is 4% ahead here, but overclocking the 1600 brings it about on par, or ever so slightly ahead of the 2600. However, if you overclock the 2600 or go for a 3600, we are quickly heading into a GPU bottleneck. The last game is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and both the Phenom and FX6300 is coming up just short of 60 frames per second with equally terrible frame times. The Ryzen R5-1600 comes in 33% ahead of the 6300, with much more playable frame times, but there is still room to improve, and the 2600 just, just that. At 83.8 .8 frames per second on average, it improves upon the 1600 by 7%. Overclocking the 1600 brings it 10% ahead of the 2600 at 92.3 frames per second on average. However, when overclocking the 2600, it is overtaking the overclocked 1600 by 22% and comes in at 112.4 frames per second on average. The stock 3600 improved upon the 2600 by 9%, and, there, and if you use PBO and Auto OC with fast memory, it gains an additional 8% performance. Moving to 1440p and basically if you either using a 3600 or an overclocked 2600 you will be GPU bound. Now let's look at the relative gaming performance including both average frame rates and frame times. The reference point is the first gen Ryzen R5 1600 which is 35% faster than the Phenom or FX which are basically identical. A stock 2600 is close to 10% faster and if you pair your 1600 with some fast memory and overclock it, you can increase your performance by about 18%. An overclocked 2600 with fast memory is almost 30% ahead of a stock 1600. Then there is a 3600 which is 42.6% ahead of a stock 1600. And pairing it with fast memory and using Auto OC, we are now over 50% ahead. So the gaming winner is clearly the 3600, but what about value? Let's look at price versus performance for the Ryzen CPUs. At the time of testing, the 2600 is available for $120, the 1600 for $115, and the 3600 for $190. This means that the best value Ryzen is actually the second gen 2600. The 3600 is faster, but also quite a lot more expensive. So if you're on a tight budget, you may want to consider going for a second gen Ryzen. And actually, now that we have 12 nanometer 1600 chips, that is also a very viable choice for a budget system. And that pretty much sums it up for this video. If you're on an FX or Phenom CPU, I would say it is time to make an upgrade, especially if you're using a more powerful GPU, such as the 2070 Super. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this one. Thank you so much for watching, and farewell.